this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, I'm excited to welcome you to the first episode in Season 3 of Lawyer On Air. I'm the host of the show, Catherine O'Connell. Today I am joined by Mariko Mimura, who is of counsel at Nishimura and Asahi, the biggest of the big Japanese law firms in Japan. Nishimura and Asahi is a full-service firm with over 700 Japanese and foreign lawyers, employing more than 850 support staff, including tax accountants, patent attorneys, senior Japanese and foreign business support professionals, as well as paralegals. Mariko has a niche law practice in serving clients and developing relationships exclusively in the life sciences space. Mariko studied for her LLB at Waseda University in 1980. She then went to Chuo University Graduate School of Law, obtaining her MA in 1984, and then she graduated from their PhD course in 1989. Mariko was admitted to the bar in Japan in 1992 and joined the firm of Braun, Moria, Hoashi and Kobota from 1992 to 93 followed by the firm Takaishi Law Office from 1993 to 95. My law path starts around this point with Mariko here in 1995, as that was the year I was admitted to the bar in New Zealand. So in 1995, Mariko joined what is now Nishimura and Asahi, but at the time it was called Nishimura and Partners. Mariko has actually had two phases working under the umbrella of Nishimura and Asahi. During the first phase from 95 to 2004, Mariko gained overseas experience in a law practice in the United States on secondment from Nishimura and Partners for one year to the law firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher LLP in 1999. She then had a further very good opportunity to have a secondment in-house to a startup battery company as vice president and general counsel of Qualion LLC, and that was from 2000 to 2001. Upon returning to Japan following this time in the US, Mariko was offered a senior role in-house as executive officer and legal executive manager of GE Healthcare Japan Corporation, from 2005 and 2009, and she seized that opportunity. It's no wonder to me that Mariko excelled in-house and in this life sciences area, as she told me before our recording today that she got to really like life sciences and she also really liked working in-house. So it was that Mariko retired from her first phase at Nishimura Nasahi to continue and deepen her in-house adventure. So that position at GE Healthcare opened doors for outside board roles for Mariko as well. For her first opportunity, she was a part-time statutory auditor of GE Healthcare affiliate company, Nihon Medifysics Co. Limited in 2008, and later on from 2018 as outside director of children's toy maker, Takara Tomi Company Limited where Mariko is currently still an outside director. And Mariko had a further outside director role at precious metal company Tanaka Holdings, also called Tanaka Kinzoku. Mariko, to me, is proof that stepping up and outwards is entirely possible at any stage of your career. She is also a great example that you can be working in-house and then return to a law firm role as an attractive value add to a firm having excelled in the inside of business, right at the coalface, as we say. Mariko also tucked in further in-house experience as Director of Legal and Intellectual Property Executive Manager at Novartis Holding Japan KK from 2010 to 2015. And at that time, she was concurrently Corporate Officer and General Counsel at Novartis. 
And then she jumped from there to being a director of GlaxoSmithKline KK from 2015 to 18. Well, in her 60s, Mariko was at a turning point, and it was then through her endeavors and tenacity that defying the odds and those disbelievers, she came around full circle to nestle back in the saddle as of counsel at Nishimura and Asahi for her second phase of working with them. This transition back into big law is a remarkable and inspiring story, and we will go into that today. Well, as you can tell from that huge introduction, Mariko is yet another wonderful lawyer extraordinaire, and I'm very pleased to bring you Mariko as my guest today and share her story with you. Mariko, welcome to the show. Hello, Catherine. Thank you very much for nice introduction, and I'm very honored to be here with you. Thank you so much. Well, today we are going to be talking about your career path, Mariko, how you navigated that career in Japan and the US, uh, your current of counsel role and balancing that with your various outside board positions. And I'd really love you to talk about your passion for life sciences and bringing up that next generation of associates. How does all that sound? Yes, great. Good, good. Well, today we're talking online. In fact, I'm at the very end stages of my remote working experience in New Zealand. Uh, and I'll be back in Japan when this episode hits the airwaves. But if you and I were meeting up in person, Mariko, where would we be? Do you have a, a favorite wine bar or cafe or restaurant? And I'd love you to tell me what would be your choice of beverage off the menu. Okay, so... I will take you to a nice bar on the top of the tall building, mm -hmm. maybe some hotel, and have a nice night view in front of us. And I will order a nice sake for you. Oh, sake. So Japanese rice wine. Yes. Yes. Oh, would that be hot or cold? Cold one. Fantastic. I actually, as you're talking about the night view, I start to feel like I'm missing Japan. I love New Zealand, but I'm missing uh, that beautiful night view that we get in Tokyo, especially in these winter days. Wow, that sounds lovely. So um, I wonder which hotel you're thinking of. Maybe Shangri-La Hotel in Tokyo, Tokyo Station. That sounds great. It has a really nice view, yes. Lovely. And they also have nice uh, kind of snacks, hors d'oeuvres as well, don't they? Yeah. Lovely. Wow, that sounds so much fun. I can't wait to do that when I get back to Japan and uh, we can get together. Thank you so yes. much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mariko, I've actually seen you in the past on webinars and speaking at conferences. You may not know this, um, but you've been shining as a presenter in your life sciences and other areas. But we officially only met at the start of 2022 when I think it was William, yes, William Blake, a really nice executive recruiter in Tokyo, introduced us. Yes, and I love how you were at a firm and then you went back in to in-house counsel, then you came back to the firm. And so that was kind of similar to my track record before I opened up my law firm. And so I'm really indebted to you for saying yes to come on the show because I wanted to talk to you about that pathway. And I'm so glad Will introduced us. How did you come to know Will? Did you both meet in person before? Yes, I think he contacted me to introduce do some outside council opportunity. Right. And I think he suddenly called me or gave me an email and I responded that I'm very much willing to meet and we met somewhere in person. Lovely. Well, maybe we can get together again too when I'm back and when, you know, this uh, pandemic allows us to, so we can have a, maybe have sake together as well. Yes. Yeah, yes. that would be great. Yes. Well, Ma <laughs> well, Mariko, before we dive back into your career, let's go back to your very early days because I think you grew up in Japan for the whole time. But do you remember back in those early days what you wanted to be when you were a child? Wow, it's a good question. Actually, when I was six years old, I went to London and I lived there for two and a half years uh, due to my father's work. 
And maybe that experience was a, a very special experience to me. And I was honestly so nervous at first. And I didn't have friends for a couple of months. But after that, I made a very good friends there. And my life kind of changed. And at that time, I wanted to become a air how do you say, air hostess? Yes, air hostess. I don't know that we call them that now, but we did call them that then because I wanted to do that as well as being a teacher. Really? So really? Uh, cabin cabin crew, I think we call them now, but yes, it was air hostess. That was the the glamorous job that we wanted to do. Right, exactly, yes. same. <laughs> wow, okay, so that's from six to eight years of age or six to eight and a half. You're yes. in London. Yes. Oh, my goodness, because I always detect a little bit of a an English accent, English, English accent when you speak really? English. So I wonder really? if that came from, yes, those days you were in uh, London, maybe. Yes, I think so. <laughs> At that time, I was very small. So my English is only for the children's English. Mm. But I think the the pronunciation is a little bit more English than American, maybe. I, th I think so. I think uh, when you learn English at such a young age like that, even when you went to the America later on, I think your English that you formed when you were younger has probably stayed with you uh, more than it has in the States. And maybe even when you were in the States, they may have said to you, you sound like you came from England. Did they oh, say wow. that to you? No? Sometimes, yes, sometimes. Yes, yeah, I thought so. Wow, that's amazing. So you wanted to do the same kind of job that I did when I was a child teacher or air hostess. Um, and yes, then though and you... we are doing very similar <laughs> things right now. Here we are. There we go. That's it's very, very interesting. And that's why I love this idea of speaking with you today. And I know you went straight to Waseda though. So you, did, you came back to Japan and then continued your education here and then went to Waseda to do law. So how did law come up as a decision for you? Did you have someone influence you from those London days or when you came back that triggered your interest in the law. So in my days, many of the, or most of the women went to the literature in a university, and I was planning to do that. But when I was studying, I went to some place to get together with my friends and two or three days and study together. And some of the group was there also. And the group was the people who is studying for the bar examination. And they were older people from me mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. but they were studying and they were telling me what is the bar examination, what is the lawyer. And mm -hmm. I was so interested. So before the university examination, like two or three months before, I suddenly decided to challenge the law faculty mm. and I was successfully in the law faculty and I asked my parents that instead of literature I want to learn law and I decided to go this way. Wow that's amazing isn't it how a chance meeting if you hadn't been in that group right. maybe you wouldn't have heard that conversation and this comes up a lot with our guests as they are there at the right time to yes. hear that hear that inspirational information. And so what did your parents say when you told them? Well, they didn't deny because they knew that I am a very strong person and I never obey them. So they knew that <laughs> whatever they say, they don't succeed. So. Well done, you. Wow, I love that. Okay, so did you like studying the law? Were you glad that you did change from literature to law? Did you like it? Yes, actually, studying the law may be not so interesting, but becoming a lawyer, I think mm. it was the best way I could choose. So I, I think it was good that I went to law faculty and started the career as a lawyer. Right. When you left there, you went to Chio University as a, the graduate school and also did their PhD course. Was that also in the law, that course? Yes. And actually, uh, as I said, I did not 
like studying law so much. <laughs> <Yes> . It's not a science and mm -hmm. it's a kind of reading the books and the judgments and yeah. I didn't think it is so imaginative and mm -hmm. so I wanted to study philosophy. So I was in a, a law faculty when I was uh, in a graduate school but I, I studied kind of uh, law philosophy oh, and I, I studied like Kant or Hegel mm. at that time. <laughs> mm. How interesting because you're right, it's not a science, it's more of an art. You know, there's no black and white, there's no, it's all grey, isn't it? So right. um, yes. doing the PhD course then led you to have something that was more that you could grab onto that was more, I guess, concrete. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, I see. Also, I thought that I am a person who likes to be uh, myself and I don't communicate with many people and I love to you know, read book all the day. But yeah. my friends said that, no, 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 you are not that, that person. You should, you are the person who go out and meet with people, speak with people and give a troubleshooting. And so they believed that I was better in the legal practice rather than just become a, a professor in, in the university. Oh, I see. It's so amazing what you say that our friends often see things about us more than we see ourselves because they are, you know, our friends and they're interacting with us. And they know that for you, in your case, you are outgoing. You do go and meet people and you are good at troubleshooting. So I hope we can talk with or somehow um, tag your friends later on on social media so they can hear you speak so well of them because that's really important. Again, this is another a change for you that you had friends who kind of changed your direction, set your sails going in the direction of being a lawyer rather than professor. I love that. Exactly, yes. Wow, so you did study and then finish and you graduated. And I think your first firm, your first law firm was in 1992. So you had kind of successive roles there. So what were those first two roles like for you? Did you get a good glimpse of what it was like for the daily life of a lawyer? It's a first law firm, is a very good law firm, and I was willing to work there for a long time, but that was the end of the bubble, you know. Oh, I see. And the Japanese economy went very bad. And also the top two lawyers passed away just when I joined. Mm. So the law firm, how do you say, went so bad mm. and they could not have a, a lot of young lawyers. So I decided to go outside and have another trip. Right, I see. And so that was when you joined the second firm after that? Yes. What did you like about then being in that second law firm role that you had? What was different? Yes. What, was, what was it that you really liked there? Well, actually, that law firm was a starting up law firm. And my boss was former IBM in-house counsel. And he was one of all the in-house counsel in Japan. He was the first in-house counsel in a big Company. Really? Wow. Yes, and he was very famous about that. So I think mm. I was interested in in-house counsel even when I was very young, mm. uh, as a young lawyer. So I think I wanted to learn from him about, you know, how you go with the business. That's what I learned from him. That's amazing. And so you joined the firm, but you were still thinking about possible in-house counsel roles because you would have had a great opportunity to speak with him a lot about his former in-house counsel role that he had. Yes. Yeah, I see. And so you spent a few years with him and in that firm, and then this big jump happens, doesn't it, to Nishimura yes. and Asahi or Nishimura and Partners. What happened then that you moved from the small firms to the big firm? Did they 
come and get you or did a recruiter headhunt you? Tell us about that jump. I'm very interested to hear how that happened. Okay, so when I was uh, in Takaishi Law Firm, worked with him, I was working with uh, one of the lawyer who is a Nishimura and Asahi, current Nishimura and Asahi partner. And I talked with him about my career. And of course, the small law firm is interesting, but the work itself is not so you know, big ones and exciting ones. Mm. And he encouraged me whether I am interested in working with Nishima and Asahi because there is a lot of big work, big opportunity to have a lot of experience than a sole practitioner. And I thought, and I don't think I become a Nishima and Asahi partner, but I thought it is a very good experience for me if I work with a lot of people and a lot of, you know, big companies. And so that I decided to move to a big law firm and study and work there to have more experiences. Right. Okay. And so what's something that surprised you about the difference then between those smaller law firms you were with and that big law firm? Were there some big surprises for you? Actually, there were a lot of works, Mm. a lot of works and always busy, no time to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, yes. Mm. But but it was a good, good experience for me. And I thought I will only work for two or three years, but actually I worked there for 10 years until I moved to in-house. Yes, you were there for 10 years, right? 1994 or five through to 2004. And I think during that time also you got that opportunity to travel to the US and work there on two secondments. So did the partner that you're talking about or another partner offer that opportunity for you to go and and be an in-house counsel and work in the secondment to the other American law firm. How did that come yes. about too? Mm. Yeah, at that time, all young lawyers went to the United States and people after working like four or five years in Mishima and Asahi, many lawyers go to the LLM in yes. the United States and then work for one year in a, a law firm. Right. But I was already old enough person, and I thought instead of going to the university and study again, because I studied a lot mm. uh, when I was in a Chuo University, so I thought I want to go to the, the law firm directly. So I asked my partner whether, you know, some law firm – will take me. And I got an offer from Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. Right. So you asked for it. Yes. Okay. And was that quite unusual then to have asked for it when most people did that path of going to school first? Yes. At that time, in the big law firms, most of the people went to study LLM and then become a New York bar and then go to the law firm and right. study for one year. So I think I was very special because I didn't go to the university mm. because uh, maybe I don't like studying. <laughs> right. But was that not inspirational for other people who followed you in the firm after that? Perhaps you carved out an idea or pathway for others after you to also, if they were a little older and had studied to go directly to a law firm. Do you know if that happened after you? Yes. I don't know whether I had any influence to that, but many people now have uh, some various opportunities. So not only go to LLM and then law firm, some people go to the government office and work there for one or two years and come back to Nishima and Partners. So they don't always go to the foreign countries, but maybe they work in Japan to have some 
experience. Some people go in-house and come back. So it was not only one way to go, but right. now people have a various way to choose. Sure. Okay. So what was different then about working in a Japanese law firm and then that US law firm? It must have been a bit different to working in Japan. Can you remember the things that you thought, oh, that's different or, oh, that's different to Japan? Can you remember back then to those things? I think the way of working in the law firm is very similar. But because I was a kind of guest, I was not a, the United States admitted lawyer, my work is very um, limited. And so I had a lot of time to play golf <laughs> or <laughs> to go somewhere right. to relax. So my life there was very relaxed one, and I enjoyed a lot. I'm sure you were forming relationships as well on the golf course yes. and with the other things you were doing, <laughs> I'm very sure. And then after that law firm secondment, there was the other in-house secondment, wasn't there, to Qualion? Yes, that was uh, one of the greatest experiences in my life. A partner of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher was outside counsel for Alfred Mann, who is an angel, a very rich angel. Mm. And this Alfred Mann established a battery company, a rechargeable battery, which can be put into the um, implantable medical device. Mm. And at that time, for the rechargeable lithium-ion battery, Japan was the most advanced company. So this Alfred Mann asked one Japanese engineer to become a, a CEO of this Qualion. But the Japanese engineers didn't know about the law, how to establish a company, how to manage mm -hmm. a company. And it was very difficult for them to communicate in English. So this partner called me one day and said, Hi, Mariko, I'm a partner of Gibson Dunn and Crutcher, and I heard that you are very fluent in Japanese. <laughs> and I said, Oh, yes, I yes. am very fluent yes. in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I am, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and he said, Oh, good, then can you communicate with this person? And first mm -hmm. I started to give advice to this company as a Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher lawyer. Right. And then yes. they asked me whether I can help them as an in-house and full-time. Oh, and, I and see. Yeah, I was so interested. So I said, okay, yes. And I started to work with this company as a, a vice president and general counsel. Wow. That's alongside that CEO, the Japanese engineer? Yes, I see. That's so cutting edge at that time to be working in that area. And I think from what you're doing now, that gave you that kind of inspiration or excitement in that medical devices area that gets you perhaps on this next uh, role that you're coming back to Japan for in GE Healthcare. But exactly. how exciting that was for you. Well, so I give you an example which made me so excited. So there was a factory to make a battery. Yes. But at first, only 1% of the product was successful. So if you make 100 batteries, 99 batteries cannot be used. Mm. And we wondered why it happens. But the, the president was an engineer. So he was only interested in technology, engineering, and think of a new concept of battery. And he was not so interested in how it is going on in the factory. So I went in the factory and found out that the process was not uh, really organized. So I asked engineers, nine engineers, to go into the factory and teach them how to make it. Because there was nine processes to make 
a battery. And each engineer went to the one process and teach each of the technicians. And then after maybe two months, a little bit more than one month, 99% of the product was successful. Ooh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you turned that around. Yes. Well, I did not, but I ordered to do so. Yes. So, <laughs> so you I'm had the idea. Of... I think you're being very humble, but you had the idea to recognize, to first of all, go to the factory and find out yes. what was going on, see the process, could see that there were unbelievably nine processes there and get someone in to teach each of those processes, different engineers. I think that's absolutely incredible. And again, you know, with my manufacturing background uh, as in-house counsel, this is very, very much inspiring and interesting to me because I, I can hear and see exactly what you're doing there. And I know that lawyers don't get the credit for it, but sometimes we do have an ability to see something in a different way. And that's how we can help the business. And this is what you did. Yes, exactly. So I was so interested in manufacturing. Wow. Yes. And so after I came back to Japan, I wanted to be an in-house counsel where they have a manufacturing site. Okay. And so that's where GE Healthcare Japan Corporation role came up for you? Yes. Right. And... How did that happen? Because you came back and you would have been a, would have been expected to join the firm again. But so for three years I went back, and one day I had a call from a headhunter, and he asked me whether I am interested in a house position. And at that time, many of the financial companies and also IT companies was hiring in-house counsel. So I said to him that I am not interested in finance, I am not interested in IT, but if you can offer me a position where they have a factory, and then he came back to me with this GE healthcare position. And right away I said, okay, this is the position for me, so I will join there. <laughs> oh, I see. So that experience that you had in the States as well would have been very helpful working in the, the manufacturing industry that you had there with that particular yes. in-house role. I see. That is so amazing. And so I want to also ask you then how these outside board roles came about because they seem to blossom, shall we say, for you once you kind of stepped away from the law firm and you took on these in-house roles, it seems like that's the point where you got that Nihon Medic, Medi Physics work and then Takara Tomina and Tanaka Holdings. But was that related to the fact that you had done in-house council work? Of course, yes. But for Japan Medi Physics, it was an affiliate of G Healthcare and G Healthcare's have to send a, a director, also the partner, Sumitomo Chemical, sent an outside director. So I was chosen as, as a person to go to Japan Metaphysics. And, and so I went there. And another thing I studied a lot was uh, there was a person from Sumitomo Chemical and I learned a lot about the Japanese company operation. Sumitomo Chemical and GE Healthcare had a joint venture, is it? And that was yes. Nihon Metaphysics, right? That's right. And you so got 50, the chance, 50. I see, 50 50. And you got the chance to go there and also at that time learn a lot about the corporate governance and how companies operate and how they make decisions and those kinds of things. Is that right? Yes, yes, exactly. And because it was a 50-50 joint venture, it was difficult to make a decision. So Sumitomo Chemical and G Healthcare always had a kind of dispute, mm. <laughs> maybe. So Diffic yeah, difficult the way to make a decision, yes. Yes, right, right. So I was only one person at that time, a Japanese person who was in a, a board of Japan Metaphysics from GE Healthcare side. So I was kind of becoming a middle person between oh. GE Healthcare and Sumitomo Chemical and the relation between 
Jean Healthcare and Sumitomo Chemical was not so good at that time, but I tried to make each other understand each other mm. and become a middle person. So and then, kind of, yeah, bridging yeah. them together. Right, 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 right. I see. That's also a very good skill of a lawyer, right? To bring people together. Um, even negotiating big deals, you want people to actually come together and get to the answer, get to the place where they can actually cooperate together. That's amazing. And that role was a statutory auditor role. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, correct. Is there anything else about that role you wanted to speak about? Well, outside statutory auditor's role is not so different from outside director's position because outside director and outside auditor needs to kind of supervise the company. But the director is more an operational side. So they super, supervise and advise for operation or execution of the company. The statutory auditor, however, has a role more to audit. So don't get into the operation, but look at the operation and see whether it is going well or not. So from my experience, it is statutory auditor's right and obligation to interview people, management, and people in the execution side. So I think the statutory auditor can have an opportunity to understand about the whole company business better than outside director. And so as a lawyer, to see whole business and provide the opinion is very important. So I think statute, outside statutory auditor's position is very good for lawyers. I really love that you've talked about this because I did want to ask you about the outside statutory auditor role because sometimes I think it's seen as the little sister to the big sister of outside director. And I believe, like you've just said, and I – Myself and my current outside statutory auditor role that I have really enjoy that role because you do get to do that auditing, asking the questions, providing the governance, compliance, risk management in a kind of business strategy review role, being able to be asking those things to be checks and balances, as well as looking at financials, obviously. So I do love that you've gone into that. And I think from your perspective, is it true that you would say to women lawyers, don't discount that role as a real part of the journey to search for an outside board role because outside statutory director, a sta outside statutory auditor, I'm sorry, is also a very, very good role to have in Japan. Would that be what you would advise as well? Oh, yes, of course. I, I do recommend people, if you have an opportunity, I strongly recommend that you go and so that you can learn about the business industry and then you will have a good skill to advise to your client knowing business and industry. And that is very important part of the lawyers to give advice to the company's clients. Mm, I'm so glad you've talked about this because I, I want to say hurrah for the outside statutory auditor because I think it's a position that's undervalued perhaps or not seen as glamorous as a, a director role that's on the outside. And I, I love that you've brought this up and I hope for people who listen to this that they broaden their horizons and think about the outside statutory auditor role as well. It's really amazing. And the other thing I think that's quite obvious from the roles that you've got is that it's quite obvious that you've taken on board roles that are not in your sector, not in your industry. And I think that's also very interesting is that most people would look perhaps for an outside board role that focuses on the same or aligned industry that they've got experience in. But you've done something different there. What led you to go into a different industry like the children's toys or the metallics uh, industry? And how has that given you another perspective through that different lens of another industry? Yeah, good question. Because I am, as you in introduced me, I really work 
exclusively in the life science business. So I have a lot of clients in this sector. So if I take one company outside director or statutory auditor position, there will be a conflict of interest. And so I, I have to give up to give advice to many companies. So when I came back to Nishimura and Asahi, of course, I wanted to stay in a business. But at the same time, I thought that I will not be outside director of this life science industry. And then I had a offer from this toy company, Takaratomi. Yes. And I thought, you know, this industry is also niche and interesting. Mm, sure is. <laughs> yes. And it's very different from pharmaceuticals or medical device, but maybe I, I can learn more from this toy business. And also uh, Tanaka Kikinzoku, Tanaka Holdings, they are the metal company, but their business is really various. They are working for many industries. So now I can learn there from them various industries, not only life sciences. And so I can think of what is the next work and I can give feedback to pharmaceutical or medical device company. So in growing the area of what I know is always a good thing when I really, even if, if I really focus on life science business. Right. I think you've hit on a great point there with broadening your vision to other things that will bring back inspiration and ideas and other experience to your current role, you know, and where you are in your niche or niche area in life sciences. That's really interesting because I don't think we often think about that and often maybe box ourselves into certain areas, but you're saying be broader. These experiences can give you a lot back into your current, particularly current role. And I, I do really love that. This has been amazing so far. I wanted to also ask you about, I suppose it's what we talked about a little bit before we did the recording today. And that was that desire that exists between women lawyers who want to be outside board directors and companies who want to hire uh, women as outside directors or statutory auditors. But there's that tension at also that we were talking about with that skill set that women lawyers need to have by having business experience. And I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that because I think that's an interesting perspective that you've got. I know that there are many young women lawyers who want to take the outside director or statutory auditor's position. And I know many companies who are willing to hire women lawyers as an outside director and outside statutory auditors because obviously in Japan, the number of women directors and statutory auditors are too small and it is becoming a big barrier for the companies. So there, there is a market and there is people who want to go into the market, but there is, how do you say, not a good match. So I am wondering how we can match those young lawyers, women lawyers, who is willing to go and the companies who is willing to have. And in my experience, the Japanese company, of course, it should not be uh, only Japanese companies, but the companies have a culture and they tend to want to have a people who can operate in that culture. So they don't want people who, even if he or she is so good, but if he or she is heading to the place where the company is not willing to go, then it doesn't match. So I think the lawyers who want to be a director or statutory auditor, it's more a matter of communications than the skills or knowledge. Mm. So, so I think in many cases, the companies 
ask the headhunters to look for the candidates. And the headhunters are looking at what you say, how do you say, what you can contribute, not too aggressive, but not too timid. And so to communicate nicely with the headhunters is one of the good way to get such opportunity. Mm, I see. That is really interesting. Not too aggressive, not too timid, somewhere in between. <laughs> but you're so right. Communication. How on earth could you do your job as a, a great or good even uh, outside director or statutory auditor if you can't communicate? Uh, that is a really key point. And so aside from communication, what do you think are the other really important things for a lawyer who wants to be an outside board member? Yeah. Of course, you should understand the industry, mm. the business where, where the company is in. And all the industry has a different business models. And you have to understand such business model to be able to give good advice. So first learn how this company is making income, how this industry is growing or losing. Mm. And that, that is the most important thing if you be a company executive. Mm. Would you also add to that things like, often for me, I think about being curious and interested, mm -hmm. obviously interested in their business. Is it, is it important to <laughs> have some desire to try and make changes or is that making changes or innovation, is that not really your role or is it your role? What do you think? It is included in outside director or statutory auditor's role. Maybe statutory for statutory auditor, not so innovative, but the outside directors are required to be innovative. For example, Takara Tomi mm. has six outside directors who has a different expertise. For example, like IT people, DX people and also came from various industry, for example, NTT or Bank of Japan or right. other industries. And we started to talk among the outside councils and how we can help the company to grow for a middle or long term. Mm. And we decided to interview with those management team and see how they can go for, for middle and long term. For example, there is a leading DX company person and he believes that even a toy business has to change the face mm. to DX. And we, we want to give advice to them so that, of course, the decision is made by themselves, but they have more knowledge and they have more informed decision making if we really give our knowledge and our experience. Mm, I'd never thought of DX in the toy industry, digital transformation. That's yes. got me thinking. Interesting. Wow. Thank you so much. I want to actually now move back to your current role, which is your off-council role. And you again told me before we recorded today that it took a little bit of work to find that role for you back in the law firm. And I think that's a story that's really inspirational to others who might be around their late 50s, early 60s and you know think that it's really time to complete that they don't need to have another job or they think they've got this mid misbelief perhaps that no firm will hire them and so I'd really love you to talk to us about this how you did go about finding your way back to Nishimura Nasahi and how that unfolded phase two of working okay. with them mm. yes okay so m maybe it's not so exciting um <laughs> But in, in my 50s, I was only how to say, a person who has an energy, and I never thought I will retire, and I will work until I will be 90 years old. Mm. And I was 
okay until 90 years old. But actually, when I became 60 years old, I was not so, how do you say, any... Not so energetic? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. So I couldn't work for three days through, and I had to sleep more, Mm. and I have to rest more. And I thought, you know, getting older means that you have to change your way to live. So I thought, how can I work until like 80 or 90 whatsoever? If I am in a company, of course, I cannot work until that time. And so I I thought I want to come back to outside council because if you become a sole practitioner, there is no age limitation. And also, I wanted to start slow and don't work as hard as I was young. Mm. And so that I decided to go back to a law firm so that I can learn again how to work as a lawyer outside. And I offered to several law firms whether you want me, do you want me, am I helpful for your law firm? And surprisingly, all the law firms offered me to join them. Mm. And one of the law firms was Nishimura and Asahi because I was a graduate from them. And they also said that they want me. And it was kind of a surprising for me because when I left the law firm in 2004, I thought I will never come back to law firm because Mm. the in-house counsel role and outside counsel law role is very different. So I can never uh, come back as an outside lawyer. However, within these 15, 13 to 15 years, the law industry has changed a lot, I think. And the law firm's role at that time, when I was in Ishimura and Partners before, lawyers' role was more to provide, how do you say, legal advice. And law is this and this and this. If you go this way, you will be like this. If you go path B, it is like this. If you go past C, it is like this. And it's your decision to choose whatever you like. But now the client is willing to the lawyers to give more practical advice. And to give practical advice, you need to understand the industry, the business, and you can be more help to the clients if you understand the business and regulation in this industry and provide advice. So the law firms were very interested in people who worked in one industry as an in-house counsel. So I thought, well, the world is changing. So now it looks like that law firms are willing people like me to come back and work in the law firm. That was my surprise. Yeah, it is a surprise, isn't it? Because I would have thought the same as you. There's no way you can go back to especially a big four law firm in Japan, but there you go. And that's why I also wanted you to share that because it proves and, you know, you've broken the mold and and, uh, said to the disbelievers that it's not possible to return to a law firm role after being in-house, but it certainly is. And you can provide a different kind of legal advice uh, that is developing around the business of law as well and giving business advice. And I know your mission is to grow that life sciences group and strengthen the relationship with your life sciences clients. And also your passion, I think, is to help that next generation of associates be really great business-minded lawyers. I think that's right. And how are you doing that? How are you helping them to think about giving business-savvy advice to their clients, to your clients? I do work with younger lawyers 
for the legal advice to the clients. And I have a lot of meetings with the clients where the young lawyers are with me. And I think they can learn on the job. And also they can learn how to provide advice, not only give that, that, you know, explain about the law, but to provide the consequences of what the client is willing to do and how we can help the client to, to do whatever they want to do. And in many cases, of course, we, as a lawyer, we must say no if there is a big risk, but how to manage the risk? We, we need to communicate with the client. And so my way of doing providing legal advice is more communication with clients and see what they want and just focus on the research, not do all the researches, but focus the researches to the way the client wants to go. Mm-hmm. And I think they can learn uh, from me while doing such um, work with me. I hope. I hope so. I hope so. I'm sure. (laughs) What's your future dream then for this role that you're in or for the future of law in Japan? That's a big question. It is. What's your question? Yeah, what do you see as your vision for how the law will develop even more and especially you and and your particular role? Mm. The METI, the Ministry of Economy and Trade, is now announcing about the agile world, yes. which means that everything is, is not so steady and we need to make a decision in a moving mm. situation. Right. And so in this era, the law itself and also the legal mind is very important to make a decision. So in the past, maybe the business is only thinking about the business, the the deal. And after they make a project, they come to lawyer, hey, is it legal or illegal? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And the lawyer's work was to say yes or sometimes no. But now, since it's an agile era, the lawyers have to be in a decision-making process. Mm. So lawyer is not only a lawyer, but the lawyer should be one of the business person who give advice from a long-term thinking. So legal world is commingling with the, the business. Mm. And lawyers will not only be a lawyer, but also the members in the society to make the growth of the company, society, or country. So I don't have any doubt that lawyers' work will expand, Mm. no doubt. Commingling, it's a bigger role, a broader role in society, impacting society and communities and companies, more than just being very narrow within law or business. It's going to be much more expansive. I think that's very interesting. Wow. Great. Thank you. Well, I want to change gears a little bit and just talk a bit more about your routine and maybe get a little bit philosophical as we work towards the end of the recording today. But I want to know, Mariko, how it is for you each morning? How do you start your day and get yourself off on the right foot? And do you keep quite regular hours right now or are they a little bit irregular with what's going on in this pandemic? Tell us a bit more about your routine. Yeah, actually, I am a very irregular person. I see. And <laughs> <laughs> there is no routine. It was not only after uh, COVID-19, but my life was always irregular. I see. Of course, when, yeah, of course, mm-hmm. when I was working in a company, my day was a little bit regular because I have to go 
to the company at nine o'clock or nine thirty. And if there is a meeting or、um, seven o'clock, I have to go early. But、uh, really, no regular、uh, routine. So if I have a meeting from the morning, I get up early. If not, I relax. And also, if I'm so busy now, many days I work from home, and my desk is three steps walk from my bed. So, <laughs>、um, if I have a lot of work to do, I wake up, walk three steps, and start working. <laughs> and if I'm not so busy, then I will have a nice breakfast. So I really irregular. There's no routine in in the morning. I see. Interesting. And and what about when you finish work? Is there some favorite thing that you like to do after you finish the day's work? What I do every day, without any exception, is to drink before going to bed. <laughs> I see. A nice <laughs> glass of sake or wine or something. Yes. Ah, I see. Okay, so、mm -hmm. what else then? I mean, you seem to be very strong-minded. So I'm wondering what your traits are that you are very most proud of. Perhaps being strong-minded is one of those, but maybe resilience. What kinds of things about you are you very proud of? Wow, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so much proud of myself, but maybe if I am. I am flexible and、right. tend to take any offer if it is possible, and I try to work for other people or company. And I am most happy when I am appreciated.、Mm. Mm. Mm. Not a nice answer. No, it's <laughs> a perfect answer. I think that flexibility, taking any offer. When I offered you to come on to the show, you said yes. Yes. So you didn't say no. You said yes, and I think those are absolutely wonderful traits that you've got. I'm working for other people,、uh, and I think also we do always like to be acknowledged. It's part of human nature, and I think it's great that you called that out because it never really stops. I think any time during our Our life, we still like to be recognised, acknowledged. It feels like we've been valued. So, I think that was a great answer. Do you ever choose、yeah. a, a theme for your year or a word of the year? For example, I do. And last year in 2021, it was intentional.、Uh, and so this year, I'm working on my word of the year, and I think it is expansion. So I'm wondering if you choose a word of the year or theme that kind of guides you, Mariko. How about that? Well, it's a, also a good question. I think I want to work for startups more than before in this year. What kind of startups? Of course, in this life science industry, there are many IT. Companies or bioscience companies, and the the reason why I wanted to work more for startups is because I now understand that there are more startups in this industry in Japan, and in the past Japan was not good at you know helping startups, but now I know many people who challenge and start. The startup companies, and I thought, as an old, experienced person, <laughs> what I can do. I don't think I can make a startup myself, but、uh, maybe I can help younger people, and、mm. that, that's my pleasure to do. Lovely. Well, let's connect afterwards again because there's a company、um, called, well, it's an organisation called Impact Tech. And they have funding from the Nippon Foundation, and I'm sure they would love to have you as one of their advisors to help them. They are a bunch of very, very new startups in Japan. They're selected for this program, and I'm sure I can introduce you. And there may be a great opportunity to help you get going on that wish you have for 2022.、Wow. Let's talk about、wow. that again. Yes, yes, that's great. You know. 
this kind of expanding network is mm. always nice because I met you and then I can meet many people through you. And yes. that's how, yes, <laughs> your life goes. <laughs> it's one of my most wonderful things that I love doing. So I'm very happy to do that. So Mariko, is there anything else today that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention or anything else we did actually talk about, but you want to re-emphasize? No, I, I think you are a very good interviewer and you <laughs> picked up, you know, from me a lot. Well, we actually, at the end of all of our podcast recordings, we get to the final, what I call final super six. And that's a quick fire round of six questions that I ask every guest to wind up the interview. And so the first question, if I might ask you, is if I was to give you one million yen in cash, of course, compliant and uh, not against the rules. If I gave you a million yen in cash in Japan, where would you spend it? Maybe you've got a favorite store or destination, or maybe it's giving help to a startup. Actually, this question was very impressive. And I thought realistically about what I will do if I have extra 1 million yen. And first I thought I organize a party. Oh. And okay. have, yes, and reserve a nice place in maybe hotel or somewhere else. And I choose 10 people or friends who I respect and ask them to bring two people who I do not know mm. so that I can talk with those people. I can expand the, the network and maybe these people, each other, become uh, you know, friends and establish their own networks. And then I thought, wait a minute, but if I have a party with 30 people, even if it's three hours, you know, I can talk with one people very short. Mm. So next I thought, Maybe I will divide this opportunity into 10 and reserve a nice restaurant and have one friend with two guests and we have a drink among four of us mm. and expand network. And I do that 10 times. I love it. <laughs> what a great idea. You could go to 10 different restaurants and I think it would be more intimate. I love that idea. I also like the big party idea. So mm, maybe we should talk about that uh, at some time as well. And wow, that's a lovely answer. Also, I'd like to ask you the second question then, which is if you have a book or a podcast that you are reading or listening to or that you've read in the past that you recommend. I think many of the people has already read, but one of the most impressive book I saw recently is uh, in Japanese, Hito Shinsei no Shihonron. Mm. And I think that the, the uh, English translation is the capital in Anthropocene. Mm. I don't know if my pronunciation is... Mm. <laughs> good or not, but the capital in Anth Anthropocene is a kind of the showing the new world and how people have to change their mindset and from growth to non-growth. And of course, you know, I, I have so something I don't agree with, but mm. in any case, even you agree or not, I think it's good uh, book to read. Wow. Okay. Sounds good. Is it only in Japanese, not in English? I don't know. At least I read in Japanese. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for that. And what is your favorite saying? Do you have a, like a kotowaza or a saying that you really like? Yes. And this is uh, one of the saying which I was told when I was in a very serious time. When I was working in Novartis, there was a um, scandal and there was um, some integrity issue in the data of the clinical trial, which 
the doctors have done and the Novartis has helped. And there was a big scandal and I had to lead to recover from this big scandal. Mm -hmm. And it was so tough and hard. At that time, one, one of my friends gave me a word, old saying, God only challenging those who can overcome it. Mm. And I thought that was great. And that says many things. And of course, you know, it, it means that I should endeavor to overcome. But also, this friend told me from this word that I should think by myself, what is the best solution? And I have to think and lead people what, you know, we can do the best. So don't depend on other people, but think yourself, and then you will finally uh, be able to overcome whatever situation you are in. Mm. That's kind of thing, the saying I, I like the best. That is lovely. Really, really nice. Wow. And moving from that, is there someone famous, a celebrity or someone you would love to meet or have already met? Kamala Harris. Oh, yes. That's come up. I think that was also Angela Yuen's desire to meet Kamala Harris. Okay. Really? Yeah. Why? I was so impressed Why were you by so her talk. Mm. Yeah. I see. Have you read her book? No, actually, no. I only heard her talk and I was so impressed. If well, you have a good recommendation of mm. her book, please yes. let me know. Yeah, she has I, a book. Yeah. I have read it and I have it on my bookshelf, so you're welcome to borrow it. Oh, great. All right. So talking of bedside cabinets and what's on your bedside cabinet, if it's a book or what is on your bedside cabinet? Mariko, and something in your house perhaps that inspires you? Apple Watch. Apple Watch, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason yeah. is I bought this Apple Watch, and this is Elmis Apple Watch, and I bought it last December. The reason is, you know, I am a non-technical person, and I'm really not interested in the new technology or new device, and I was really not interested in Apple Watch. Many young people has an Apple Watch, but mm -hmm. I thought, no, no, no I, I don't need it. But last November, I had a drink with uh, old men, five, five old men. Five old men. I, <laughs> yes, I, I had a drink with five old men, okay. and these five old men all had Apple Watch. Whoa. <laughs> and they said that, oh, yours no, not Apple Watch. Wow. <laughs> and so when the mm -hmm. young people have Apple Watch, I didn't think I will compete with them, but I thought, wow, I should compete with those old men. <laughs> and so I decided to buy Apple Watch. <laughs> but you got a brand one. Did you say Emma? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I didn't yes. know they existed. That's yes. very interesting. So I, I think I, I could beat those old men now. Yeah, so I'm so happy them. with that. <laughs> I bet it looks good on your wrist. So next time we do meet, I look forward to looking at your wrist and seeing your Apple Watch. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. And one last question. Um, what is something about you that people do not know? Maybe the Apple Watch was one thing, but is there something else about you that a lot of people do not know? Yeah. I, I thought about what people don't know, know about me. And I think I'm a rather transparent person, but I, I'm very sure that nobody knows that I am every day deeply considering about two choice, whether I take bath first or whether I drink sake first. And I always tend to drink sake first, but once I drink, then I don't want to take bath. It's more difficult to take bath if I'm more oh, drunk. You're funny. So you're every funny. day. <laughs> Sorry, my story, half of my story is about sake or drink. I'm and this is in this. the evening, isn't it? This is the evening, of not course. the morning. Yes. Of course. Got after, it. After, I, after I come back from 
the the work and right. I'm so tired. Right. I just sit down and see, wow, do I take baths now so that my sake will be more happy one? But I'm so tired, so I want one drink before bath. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. Well, that's funny and very, very, very funny. You've had a, you know, you've really enlightened me and um, made this a very joyous episode. So thank you, Mariko. We've unfortunately come to the end. And so you really have shared with us so many very funny, uh, but also truly inspirational stories. I'm a real believer, uh, even more than before, that. You know, we women lawyers uh, shouldn't be bound by the number that's our age. We should keep on driving forward, beat those old men and, and, and do things, right? Be wearing our grit and achieving anything we can in, in our lawyer and personal lives. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories and your insights and nuggets of advice. It's been really great to connect with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk with you. So how can listeners um, and other aspiring lawyers connect with you? Can they do that through your law firm or on LinkedIn? How can they connect? Uh, well, please uh, send me an email. That's the best way. Okay, that's great. We'll put that in the show notes afterwards. So anyone who's interested in connecting with you can connect through email that's brilliant yes okay. yes right. don't, don't hesitate to do no and do it will show stuff. up it will show up on your uh, wrist on your apple watch when they uh, contact you right yes thank you <laughs> well i'll finish it there we've had this fantastic conversation about so many different things i'm really grateful for you for coming on being my first guest in season three of lawyer on air and i really thank you for your own honesty and openness you definitely are transparent for all of my listeners, please do like this episode, subscribe to Lawyer On Air, and do also drop us a short review as that helps Lawyer On Air be seen and heard by many people. You can actually also jump over to my webpage and leave me a voicemail. Uh, that way we get to hear your actual voice telling us about what you enjoyed about today's guest. Thank you so much, everybody. Do go ahead, share this episode, and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer extraordinaire life. That's all for now. See you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer on Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.